him before I turn him loose on you. Sure, sounds good. Um, just maybe one or two more. If okay. That's okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> then it, then it'll be my turn, right? Then I'll be on the hot seat. Yeah. Um, just a quick question: When you say those examples of pseudogenes with mutations and NIST mm -hmm. hierarchies, do younger creationists accept that within accepted variants? Like, would you would you look at gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans and say, yeah, they, they would have inherited that mutation from a common ancestor? I would like to. Okay. So it goes back to the question of how do you identify common ancestry? And if there was a mutational signature, I would embrace it quickly. But I would say what we call a mutation and what we don't is virtually impossible at present because of the non-intuitiveness of DNA. So again, back to the language analogy, we speak less than 1% of the DNA language as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you just have to look at the history of genetics. Uh, back in the 40s, one gene, one protein, one function. I'll talk to people from a generation ago. I taught a class at Southern Evangelical Seminary on biology and, and origins. And we had a gentleman in there who's like, everything I'm learning is the opposite, or this is totally different from what I learned in school. It's changing that fast. And so what you might look at a, a textbook a decade ago is now being totally overturned. And so things that look like mutations, because they look like broken genes, I think of pseudogenes as a specific example. So when I was in graduate school, one of the newfangled, unexpected ways of DNA function uh, is actually something near and dear to my heart. So what I worked on as an undergraduate is RNA. So DNA is trans transcribed RNA translated to protein. It's the inter intermediate between the two. We're working on RNA regulation. My boss was always, RNA is the underappreciated, this is the big deal, and we need to make more of a stink about it. Well, he's basically been vindicated because the amount of literature on RNA function is uh, more than I can tell you. I mean, there's reviews written on this. Anyway, back to graduate school. So one of the shocking discoveries, I think made originally in plants, was RNAi, RNA interference, small, short. RNA snippets that bind to, and I think there's base pair differences there. They look like mistakes. Bind to other RNAs and regu regulate the function. And I remember sitting in class and one of my profs saying, Andrew Fire was in Massachusetts. He was one of the guys, he's, he's gonna get the Nobel Prize, and sure enough, got the Nobel Prize for this. So what are pseudogenes? Uh, they're, they're, they're sometimes anti-sense versions. To me, what comes to mind immediately is they're gonna function in some sort of RNA regulation. It's just too close. Does it look like a broken gene? Yes, but to me, that's decades ago biology. And I, I'm not being insulting. My point is, do, I don't disagree that it looks like a broken gene, but I also see this massive literature that's saying there are all these unexpected things RNA do. And then I look at the fact that we've actually functionally tested less than 1% of the genome. To me, the genetics community has done a really bad job making predictions in terms of function. And that's not an intelligence thing. It's just because we're dealing with a foreign language, a highly compressed, it's beyond the best computer code is really what it comes down to. I mean, we write books. We don't write books that can be read forwards and backwards. DNA can. Uh, You've got proteins. There's a phenomenon, and I've, I've written part of this in a paper, I, one of the first papers I wrote, uh, protein moonlighting. So one of the 1940s ideas was one gene, one protein, one function. Uh, so some of the mitochondrial DNA proteins. Well, we know the function, it functions this particular enzyme complex, it takes this chemical, transforms it to this, releases water, whatever, transforms oxygen. This particular enzyme takes glucose and it removes this group and it's at this step, you know, this is classic, it's known. Well, now we're discovering serendipitous things like, oh, this enzyme that functions in sugar metabolism is now binding to DNA in the nucleus. Uh, we have, anyway, moonlighting. Proteins are doing things that you don't even anticipate. Let me explain it by analogy. Proteins, in, if, if you think of our bodies as biological construction projects, we start as a single cell, and all of this is built in the womb, basically, so that the human form we recognize this as a parent by birth. Proteins are one of the main tools for building the body. Protein moonlighting is analogous to having a multifunctional tool, but what human engineer builds a handle that is a hammer, saw, drill, and a whole bunch of 10 other things in one hand? I mean, we, don't, we don't even design, it's, it's science fiction what's going on at the cellular level. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, and just, if I could just jump in, you're saying that it's the DNA code works as if I were reading a book. If I read it this way, it would be a poem, a Shakespearean sonnet. If I read it, then I read it the other direction, it would be perhaps a newspaper clipping from the Washington Post, and it works both ways. And, and 
so again, some of the classic paradigms, you can go to some of the textbooks I have, they'll say, even in those things we thought we understood, let's say uh, you know, this particular DNA sequence codes, you know, is transcribed to this RNA, which is translated this protein, there's this talk of synonymous codon. So in short, there's 20 amino acids, uh, four different DNA letters, there's different languages in your cell, and four different DNA letters can't code for one letter then can't code for all 20, it's, it's groups of three. Three DNA letters code for a single unit of a protein. Uh, and I was taught the third, so there's some redundancy, that's the point I'm trying to get at. There's some redundancy in DNA coding for protein. Well, I was taught, well, that's, there's this wobble position, position three, if you look at textbooks, statistically then, you know, it's, it, it can be variable. Well, now we're finding that actually it plays a functional role. And there's even reviews being written about this now, that these aren't just well, it tolerates error, the cell uses different redundant elements to slow and speed the process. I mean, the level of information compression into every single letter is, is really boggles the mind. So that was a different example than you're asking about, but it's a crazy field. <laughs> One think, more question? One more question. And okay. And Although there's, there's some things I would say in response. Yeah. Please but, do. We but, can have a dialogue. Uh, no, this is a dialogue. Oh, okay. Well... Yeah. I don't want to take up too much time, but there are cases where we see pseudogenes, where we actually see the same, many cases actually, where we see the same gene in a functional state, say in mouse, relative to the human genome. And we have the ability to determine its function experimentally in mouse. So one of the examples I gave was along those lines. So what do you think of those kind of pseudogenes? Like where we actually have experimental evidence that it has a certain role in mouse, it's in the same little block of genes in the human genome, yet it's non-functional, or at least it can't have the same function that's in the mouse. So why is it that we see that pattern? I'm curious, from a young Earth perspective, what does one do with that? I would say, and you can tell me if I'm articulating the argument correctly, there's an element of homology in the argument and there's an element of non-function. You have the homology in that it's shared, hmm. but then the other element of the argument in the human looks like it's non-functional. Sure. So, to the homology element, I go back to design and saying, uh, human engineers reuse common patterns for similar purposes. What would be the purposes then in DNA? And that's to me where it gets sticky because we're so bad at determining purpose. I mean, the whole idea of protein moonlighting, the whole idea that RNA is doing all these crazy things and you, I mean, is it weekly, monthly that some new discovery is coming out? So. Can I predict at the moment what that human gene is doing? No, but in five years, I have a pretty good guess that I will because it's going that fast. And it's not what we anticipate it to be. Uh, and, it's, and there's so many interactions in the cell. So one of the hottest fields right now is the 3D arrangement of DNA in the nucleus. That the cell not only uses DNA according to sequences that exist before and after the gene, but it's how it's compressed and uncompressed and wound together. Uh, there are so many serendipitous discovery. I think it'd be foolish to try to assign a function. I don't know that anyone could assign a function, and what it turns out to be will probably blow our minds. And I think it would be highly premature to say it's non-functional because of the trajectory. So many paradigms have been overturned in the last decade. I mean, I've been, I graduated in 2003 from undergrad, and I have my undergrad textbook. And so, what is that? 15 years or so, and things are being overturned then. It's so fast. Uh, like I said, I would love to have a tool to say, this shows the signature of ancestry, this one doesn't. And I don't think I can do that, given how fast things have changed in terms of what we say is functional and what we say is not. One last question. I asked this question of Georgia Purdom, 